again, I'm Grant Lewis, and welcome to The Room Live. We're filming here in Hollywood, um, Los Angeles, California, and I'm really excited to have um, our guest tonight. And what I really want to sort of pose to you out there is, have you ever done something in your life where you look back and wish you hadn't have done it? And maybe there's this part of you that sort of holds on to the past and it's preventing you from moving into the future. Well, tonight's guest, for me, is just uh, the most incredible story. I got given this book, I was on holiday with a group of friends, and I got handed this book and said, you know, hey, you might like this. And it was like watching a train wreck, is the only way I can describe it. I just sat there and read page for page. People were talking to me, and I was like, go away. You know, just go away. I, I, was, I was mesmerized by this book. It was um, the most incredible success story in the beginning. The, here is uh, a guy, his name is uh, Jordan Belford, and he uh, was making a million dollars a week at you know, started at age 26, making a million dollars a week, and he was at the height of success in the stockbroking uh, world. And what happened was um, uh, the success sort of went somewhere, and we're going to find out uh, from Jordan. But you know, it ended, there was you know some drugs, some uh, hookers. Um, there was a crashing of helicopters, crashing of airplanes, sinking a hundred and uh, 67 foot or 62 foot yacht, I can't remember what it is. And this book was just unbelievable. Now the book has actually been turned, uh, is, 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 has been turned into a script and is actually, um, and we're going to talk to Jordan about that, uh, is going to come out as a feature film with supposedly Leonardo DiCaprio playing Jordan. So we're talking like an incredible story. Now my interest is uh, where, and Jordan will tell you about this, he actually uh, was indicted and actually spent two years in prison. And after that, it's sort of like, well, what do you do for an encore? You know, like that's an, what he fitted into life was just absolutely incredible. But then what do you actually do as an encore for that? How do you let that past go and start a fresh life? Especially when it would be so public and for everybody uh, to know. So um, this is the book, book the, the Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, couldn't put it down. It's an absolute incredible read. And um, please welcome Jordan Belfort to The Room Live. Okay. Thanks. So I'm done. You, you said it all pretty I much. I said I it all. I mean, I... It, I could probably add a couple things, but, you know, maybe one or two. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's the part I'm really interested in is, is um, I mean, let, let's just start with, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really interested with the story of the meatpacking business um, that you're originally in and then sort of how that led into the stockbroking right. and, and... Right. Let me give you the, I'll give you the quick story. Basically... I was a born entrepreneur. I exited my mother's womb. When I was eight years old, I was delivering papers door to door, knocking on doors, expanding a paper route. When I was 12 years old, I was shoveling driveways after snowstorms in New York. Yep. Make 20 bucks a driveway after a big snowstorm. Uh, I hit it big for the first time when I was 16, selling ices on the beach, blanket to blanket to blanket. Wow. And I, by, and that's how it started. And after that, I was hiring people to come work. I had, little, I had 12 year old kids selling puka shell necklaces for me. My mother was buttering bagels in the morning. And that was really the way I always was, was you know, moving towards life. Looking At for 16. The, yeah, I was just, you know, always wanted to make money. I didn't come from a wealthy family, I came from a good family. Um, and I was taught right from wrong, which is an interesting part of the story. But I spiraled out of control a bit later on. So, anyway, ultimately, I put myself through college with the money I made on, on the beach uh, and then spent one day in dental school. Yeah, and wow. the reason I went to dental school is because my mother had inserted a belief in my head, great woman, that you know, the only noble way to make money is you've got to be a doctor. You've got to be a doctor. Well, I didn't want to be a doctor because that would have taken 10 years. But I figured dentistry would be pretty good. I'd make a lot of money yeah. and be a pillar of the community. So I went to dental school. And the first day I walked in, I'll never forget this, it was 105 kids sitting in the dental auditorium. And the dean's in the front. And this gray-haired guy. And he says, I want to welcome you all to the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery. You should be very proud to go come this far, you're gonna really do great things with your life, being a dentist, well, it sounded pretty good. Then he says, let me say this, the golden age of dentistry is over. If you're here to make a lot of money, you're probably in the wrong place. I'm like, what the fuck, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> I stood up and I got, I walked away. I walked out, I dropped out of dental school on my first day, <laughs> all right? Didn't have the heart to tell my mother. I was yeah. like, she called me, I said, oh, things are great down in dental school. <laughs> Eventually I went back up and that's how I fell into the meat business. And yeah. I answered a blind ad in the paper and yeah. I didn't know it was sales. I never really sold anything before. The stuff I had done on the, on the beach was really just hard work. I was going yeah. blanket to blanket. I had a vision, which is important. I had a vision of what I wanted things to be like, but I never mm -hmm. really sold anything. Well, in the meat business, they were going door to door selling steaks and shrimps and lobster tails out of the back of pickup trucks. And the first day 
in the field, I broke the company record. First week, I shattered the company record, and I realized I had a gift for selling. The words just flowed. Yeah. After about three or four weeks, I was like, well, you know, why should I work for these people when I can go to the meat market myself and buy the meat, get the double markup, which I did. I bought one truck, started training people, and bought a second truck, and then I noticed that the gift I had was not even for sales, per se. It was the ability to train and motivate other people. Yeah. Before I knew it, I had 26 trucks on the road. Wow. I had 26 salesmen working for me, and I thought I was making a fortune. Now, understand this. I wasn't really making a fortune. I was making every classic mistake a business owner can make, a new business owner. Yeah. I was overexpanding. I was undercapitalized. I wasn't screening out my employees. Half of them were crack addicts. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what. Crack addicts make great salesmen. Right. Because <laughs> they want to the, get more crack. On the, on the high. <laughs> yeah. But on the binge, they just disappear. <laughs> right? so I, all of a sudden, I give a guy meat and he disappeared. I wouldn't see the guy. Three days he's under a bridge sleeping, all right? So that business went bankrupt. And I lost everything I had when I was 24 years old. And 24, I wow. Bust ba everything out. I had a little red Porsche. They towed it away. I had a tear in my eye when they towed the car away. And I had less than, I was probably in the hole $10,000, had to declare bankruptcy. And what do you do when you're that age? You know, in New York City, I wanted to be rich. I was a good salesman. I went down to Wall Street. Of course. Got a job on Wall Street. The first day, which is where the book starts off, and I walk in, it's like the military. You're lower than pond scum. You know? yeah. They treat you like, <laughs> they treat you like the lowest yeah. of the low. And I worked for six months uh, on Wall Street as a connector, this, which is just, you know, hello, Mr. Jones, and passed the phone to someone that was licensed. I wasn't licensed yet. Watch these kids. They were kids in the average age 25 to 35, and they were making half a million to a million bucks a year. And I was just watching this and I was so broke, but I still was positive because I had hope. Yeah, wow. Because when you're in a room like that and you see all these people make money, I'm like, well, I can do that. I'm like better than them. I'm the best salesman. I was all full of piss and vinegar. I was married to a great woman at the time, my first wife. She's a couple of wives ago, unfortunately. I haven't done that good in that department, which is understandable, <laughs> okay? But anyway, so my, my, she was great. She was at home and you know, finally my day came. Six months of torture of being that, the lowest guy in the total pole. I passed my test. And the manager goes, go and get him, me and five other guys. My first day on Wall Street was October 19th, 1987, the day of the great crash. And yeah. I watched in absolute shock and awe as the market went down 508 points on the first day. Of your and just like that, the game was over. Wow. That was really unbelievable. And I was like, the game's over. I never got to play. I watched everyone else play, and the game was over. And the firm I was with shut down after 100 years in business. Do you think this was because you turned up? <laughs> yeah, right. My mother said, if you went into politics, we could have had real problems, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, the firm closed down, and I was out of a job again. No money, wow. and I was really, now I was desperate. And I ended up leaving the firm, you know, was out of business. I was home, didn't know what to do. And I started looking for the help wanted section. I stumbled upon an ad for uh, stockbrokers out in Long Island. It was a very small firm. And when I walked in, they were selling penny stocks. Didn't even know what it was. Uh, but I was desperate, and the words rent money, rent money were playing in my head. I couldn't even pay the rent. Took the job, and the same thing happened as with the meat business. I was the first day, shattered the company record. But this was different, because I had this, this moment of clarity, a window of clarity. And this is one of the things I really believe that we all get in our lives. And when you're in that moment of clarity, that window, mm. you got to jump through it. And for some reason, that was just I understood a couple of things a few distinctions that other people hadn't seen, and very quickly I realized it was a niche in the market, and I developed a system. This is a turnkey system based on four things, all part of one move, essentially to get from one place to another, and it got to the point within six months that I was making a million bucks a year myself as a stockbroker, but I could train any human being, regardless of age, race, creed, color, socioeconomic background, educational status, it didn't matter. Mm. They could have this much desire, and I could amplify it, and in six months, they'd be rich too. I remember reading that in the book, that just, and that was one of the things that fascinated me, was how much the, like how much of a motivator you were. Like the, it's so easy to say, oh, well he made, you know, like at the height of, you, you know, you launched Steve Madden, you, you listed Steve Madden shoes. I, I owned Steve Madden, oh, Steve, it was my company, yeah. yeah. I, I owned it and listed it, but here's the, I, I, it's a good point what but, you're saying, yeah, I get and, it. And what I wanted to say was, it's, it's very easy to, to say, and this is one of the questions I wanted to ask you, um, was, it, it's easy to say, oh, you know, he made money because, you know, like he, he did some dodgy things. Right. But the actual fundamental principles of what you did would be applied to anything, doesn't it? Yes, okay, so there was some dodgy stuff that you did, but a lot of it was, it was like 95% pulling together a team, actually motivating people, actually getting, getting the culture, getting it to do, like there's a lot of businesses out there that are completely perfect, yet they don't have the culture that you had, they, don't have, they didn't right. have the well, motivation, well, they didn't have any of those here's things. Here's the thing, 
the truth is the fact that the five percent I did wrong, if I did that right, I'd be a billionaire right now. Yeah. Because that cost of me my success. That wasn't the that wasn't the basis of my success. The the other part of it was the basis of my success. And here's the bottom line. It's very simple. There are four things that you have to do to be wildly successful at anything. Yeah. It doesn't matter, it could be money, relationships, spirituality, in love, in community, contribution how you feel each day, it's four things, not a thousand things, not, oh, it's four. Yeah. And I was doing these four things at the highest possible level at my firm. And here's the funny part, I didn't even know I was doing them. I was doing what's called an unconscious strategy. Yeah. I had stumbled upon this because it made sense to me and sometimes when you do something really, really well, you don't even know how you do it. When you tie your shoes, you're not thinking how to put the loop over the loop. Yep. You know, it's called being unconsciously competent. And I stumbled upon this, and it was so powerful that there was what's called a good enough factor. If you're doing those four things in any aspect of your life, you could even suck at them. Yeah. But if you do all four of them together, you're still going to become wealthy. You're still going to hit whatever it is you're looking to hit. And here's how it starts, okay? The bottom line is this. Most people have goals in life. And we've been brought to think you got to be goal-oriented. That's the first mistake. Yes, yeah. you need goals, but there is something far beyond goals, which is what all successful people have, and that's a vision. Mm -hmm. It's a vision for the future. See, the, here's what it is. You see things as they are, but not worse than they are, yeah. which is what a lot of people do. Yeah. They say, oh, it's so terrible. They tell themselves this wild story about why they can't take action, and in truth, the story they tell themselves is exactly what holds them back from being successful. Agreed. It's that bullshit story that stops them from acting. They're like, and they're like, oh, there's so much, the economy, and they play the blame game, they complain, they justify, and it stops them from moving forward. So see things as they are, not worse than they are, yep. and then see them better than they are, yep. and make them that way. And when you and say better than they are, you mean like, mean, look, like just look into the future. Like in a whatever, year's time, I want it to be like whatever that. I, and those, listen, let's focus on money for a second, because especially this time, the economy, everyone's interested in making more money and securing the future for not just themselves, the families, mm -hmm. the children. And this is important. People say, you know, money doesn't matter. I'm like, oh, so you're broke. <laughs> well, that's, if someone tells it to you, they're broke. Mm -hmm. They never had any money, because mm -hmm. just look at it like this. Just imagine if you said that your wife wasn't that important. How long would she stick around? Yeah. Not too long, right? Money's important. Money is not going to make you happy. No. But an absence of money could buy you an awful lot of misery. So I look at money as this. It's a problem that needs to be solved. Yep. And here's another distinction which I think everyone should really key into. Because this misconception that you know, in some way money might be evil. Here's the deal. There's no amount of poverty that you can have in your life that can make one other person wealthy. Agreed. There's no amount of misery that you can have in your life that can make one other person happy. There's no amount of, 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 of uh, sickness in your life that can make one other person healthy. So yeah. if you want to make the world a happier, healthier, wealthier place, then get as much of those gifts you can for yourself and then spread it around. Yeah. That's the bottom line. I mean, I was thinking that the other day. I was driving along and I thought to myself, you know, if I'm in a Ferrari right now, how is that? It, it's not worse off for anybody because the guy that works at the Ferrari for actually that designs, he's got a paycheck that he can then go and, and you know, pay his mortgage and feed his kids and do all of that. The person that actually made the headlights, the person that made the wheels, the person that, you know, the other company that contracts in to make the engine, it, there's nothing, if anything, having a more expensive car actually does more for the economy and actually helps people. Yeah, but yet the old yeah. belief is, yet the old belief is, well, they're taking a resource out or, you know, well, the, the rich bastard. I hear bastard. what you're say, saying, but, you know, Ferrari isn't a particularly good example because I know a lot of really miserable people that drive Ferraris. <laughs> Driving a Ferrari is not going to make you happy. No, it's definitely not going to make and, you happy. And, and, and by the way, and, and here's the thing. If you love to collect Ferraris, you like to drive for that's great. I'll show you how to get a Ferrari. Get, making money is easy. It's really, really easy. What's harder, though, is fulfillment. Yeah. Money's just a part, a part of the equation. So here's the way it is. You see things better than they are, make them that way. It requires four things, and here, I'll tell you what they are. I'm not going to hold it back. Number one is vision. Yeah. The ability to create a clear and compelling vision for the future. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is you actually, when you set a goal, you have to get step into that goal and start to visualize it. You've got to taste it, touch it, feel it, literally really internalize it. Say, how would this world be? It's not just about when I get to there, then I'll be rich, or I get to there, I'll own a business. What's my world going to be like? How is it going to impact the people that I love? My parents, my children, how much time? See, people have a misconception. If I make money, I'll have less time for my family. Bullshit. When you have make money, you have more time for your family. Hmm. You secure the future of your family, future of your grandchildren. When I became wealthy, really wealthy, in the brokerage firm, which I'll get to later, 
and lost everything, which I did and I deserve to, because I made some fundamental mistakes, which I'll, which I'll go through too. My parents, who are now 77 and 78 years old, still uh -huh. alive, they became wealthy because of me. And they're still wealthy, and they struggled their entire lives. So when you become wealthy, it's not so much what you can do for yourself, what you can do for other people. That's where their fulfillment and the joy comes into it. Yeah. So number one is the vision, right? And if you look back at it, if you want any confirmation, look at a Gandhi, right? He survived hunger strikes and united a country, not because he had a goal for a free India. He had a vision of a free India. Nelson Mandela, all those years in jail, a vision. Yeah. It's Richard Branson, who's a friend of mine, who I know he sponsors me, my, 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 my speaking tour. He's a, he's a visionary. Bill Gates, they're all visionaries. And the best example, considering we're in Hollywood, is a guy like James Cameron. Now, here's the trap. James Cameron is probably the greatest visionary of all time in filmmaking. Would you agree? Yeah, he would he'd He was interviewed on um, Diane Sawyer, and they asked him a question of, what do you owe your success to? And what he said was this. I set really, really high goals. So even if I fall short, I'm still doing great. And people thought that was pretty profound, and I actually believe in that too. It's not true though. See, what's happening is this. James Cameron is not a goal setter. He's a visionary. He just doesn't realize because he's running an unconscious strategy himself. Mm. If you said, the, if I said to James Cameron, was it really just the goals, or do you have a vision for Avatar? He'd say, oh, of course, I will. Then he'd get all excited and he'd tell you how nothing was gonna stop him from making this movie. The fact that it took 10 years and ran 200 million over budget and he put money in himself, all, that's not what goal setters do. Goal setters will set a goal, gets tough and they abandon it. And I can't overemphasize that distinction. That's number one is vision. Second part, is the ability to manage your state, the way you feel in the moment, your emotional, your physiological state. And that is the key, bar none, the most important distinction in life. Because what that does, it allows you to access the resources that you have. If you're in an angry, pissed off, negative, unresourceful state, you can't do anything well. You've had one of those days, for instance, where everything you're doing, you're like, I can't believe I said that, I can't believe I did that, I'm such a fool, right? You had that day? We've all had that day. Yeah. Next day, similar situation, you're like, wow, you know, that was me. I did a really great job, right? You were perfect. So one day you're brilliant. Next day, same situation, you're brutal. That's not talent. That's not ability. That's the state that you're in. So the key to success is not just A, to have your vision, but to be able to manage the way you feel in the moment. Now, if you're a parent, what's the most resourceful state? Patience. <laughs> if you're a businessman looking to make money on Wall Street, it's probably certainty. Yep. Well, courage, because fear is the worst emotion of all for being a trader on Wall Street. So every business has different states that you need to master. Now, in, in most businesses, in matters of wealth, there's three. Three states that you need to master to be able to trigger at a moment's notice. And it's easy to do once you learn how, which is what I teach people. Okay? And number one is certainty, to be certain about what you're doing. The second one is clarity, to be clear, to not to be overwhelmed, which the opposite would be overwhelmed. And the third is courage is to have a conviction, to know that you might not be right all the time, but you're gonna not let fear stop you. Because if there's one distinction that between the wealthy people of the world and the poor people of the world is that wealthy people act in the face of fear, while poor people run away from fear. Agreed. Okay, so it's state management is number two. And what I do is I have this high impact process that really show people how to manage their state. Not like, oh, I'm gonna manage, but I'm talking to a razor's edge. Yeah. Not all day long, because it's not about perfectionism, it's about progression. Yeah. You get it? You want to be progress, not perfection. Yep. That's the second thing. The third thing is your beliefs. And you mentioned the word beliefs before, and people throw that word around a lot. And you know, it's a buzzword for self-development, but here's the bottom line with beliefs. It acts like, they act like governors on a car. You better prefer, let's use a Ferrari. A belief, a limiting belief, is like putting the, a, a governor on the engine of a Ferrari. The Ferrari can go 240 miles an hour, it has 550 horsepower, four valves per cylinder, 12 cylinders, but if there's that governor not letting the gas go through, you ain't going over 55. Yep. That's what a limiting belief does. It stops you from charging forward when you should and causes you to move back when you shouldn't. And we yep. all have them. They agree. And they yeah. started getting inserted in our heads when we were yay big. You know, we were all unstoppable on day one. Hmm. And then came day two when our parents started spoon feeding us limiting beliefs. Sometimes, you know, they meant well, they just didn't know because, you know, one of the things that I'm a big believer is that we were not even given our owner's manual. Hmm. Our brain's an immensely powerful computer. And this is, you know, known by, by pretty much everybody in the self-development world. Some of the top people, Dr. Richard Bandler, who I trained with, a great one of my mentors and a brilliant guy. And the first thing he said to me is, you know, you never got your owner's manual, Jordan. And because of that, you don't realize that the world around you that you take it is reality. It's really not, it's subjective. Mm -hmm. The reality I'm looking at is just subjective. I can interpret things how I want. I can have the beliefs that 
that, that, that empower me and I can shed the beliefs that disempower me. So the first thing I do when I meet somebody, I work when I coach really wealthy people, some stars in Hollywood, the first thing I do is go through what their limiting beliefs are. Yep. And you gotta root them out and it's not difficult. You, gotta, you can't just root them out, you gotta replace them with empowering beliefs, which is typically the opposite belief. Right now, what I was doing at my brokerage firm, interestingly enough, getting back to that, is each day at my firm, I give, if you read the book, I give two meetings, the morning meeting and the afternoon meeting. Yep. And in the meetings, I was actually running this strategy. I had them visualizing their success. I would talk about the life. Yep. Now, the average kid that came to work for me was about as smart as a box of rocks. <laughs> they were. They're like, you know, they're, none of the kids went to college, okay? They were not the lucky sperm club members. It wasn't the deep end of the gene pool or anything like that at all. Yep. These were the forgotten. These are my people, right? Yep. They came to me, they thought they'd be working pizzerias. And the first thing I said to them was this. The moment you walk through this door, everything in the past falls off. Yep. You sit behind this desk, you say the words I teach you, you become as powerful as the most powerful CEO in America. What am I doing? I'm breaking a limiting belief. Great. You get that? And I didn't know. And I, you didn't know that you I were doing know. that at the time. I didn't know. Time. I didn't know. Yeah. I was just saying, it's like I got riled up myself and I saw all these kids and I wanted to help them. Yeah. And I knew what they needed to hear because they grew up in, 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 in households where they weren't told they were worthy of greatness. They weren't told they were, had the ability to be successful. Every human being. You know, I can tell you something. I give seminars. I give two-day seminars, right? And you c can't believe the, the dramatic changes in people in just two days. And it's not that I'm a guru. It's like, I'm just a guy with a, a unique set of skills that I've honed over 27 years of doing this. And I know there's these basic trigger mechanisms in people. And when mm. you give them, they, it empowers them. And then they go off and they run. And they go for it and they realize all of a sudden they're capable of things they never thought they were capable of. And it's to see that, I, that's what gets me going in my life. And yeah. It happened back then with the kids at Stratton. But see, this is, this is what fascinated me was like, I was reading this book and, and all of that that you said ha was just resonating with me. I love, you know, I love the, love the morning meetings. I love the success. I loved all of those things. And a little bit about me. I left school when I was 14 years old. I went out and hustled. I washed cars instead of selling ice. Um, I started a company. I was running seminars for teenagers. I got involved with a lot of the seminar presenters, a lot of people that you've worked with. And what happened was um, I was doing very well and I was sitting on a private jet with a very wealthy businessman who was doing seminars and he spoke an incredible game just like you spoke. And something didn't feel right. There was something there. There was something amiss. And he's now serving time in jail for fraud. And that's where this book for me was like, wow, this is, I, I was lucky because he fell in front of me. And so I was able to, it was always like I, all of a sudden he popped up on my shoulder and mm -hmm. was like, whenever there was a deal or whenever there was, because when you get into personal development, like personal development and NLP and all of those things is a lot like a knife. You know, you can use it to, to <laughs> like make it, to, to use it it's to like make any, a meal. It's, it's a, t listen, it's the NLP, you know, it's, I'm a, listen, Dr. Bandler's a friend of mine. He's, he's fabulous. He, he, what Dr. Bandler did for me, and the, and the reason I went to see Dr. Bandler is very simple. Look, this book, right, it's 535 pages. Yeah. I think it's like 16 bucks in the book, so maybe a buck cheaper on Amazon. It's a good book, right? Yeah. And in this book, book. You know, in this book, there's a lot of wacky stuff. Yeah. Drug use, hookers like, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not proud of that. Just, you know, I made some huge mistakes, and I'll get into those, so that's important, too. Yeah. Very important. It's what to avoid to do is not just what to do, what to avoid to Agreed. do, right? So... Because someone has but, to go but, ahead. But, but listen, embedded in this book is the secret for success and failure. It's yes. in here. Agreed. Buried within 500. And, so if I and it's could, an entertaining read. Not, no, but imagine <laughs> if I could go in this book and highlight in red all the stuff. Just success, success, <laughs> Don't success. Do this. Blue, blue, fail. How much would that book be worth? A lot of money. Right? Probably yeah. $50, 100 bucks, 1000 th bucks to have the secret of six, right? Yeah. That's what the book is. The problem is is that sometimes when people read the book, they get so caught up in the story, they don't get the message. Because it's a funny book, because it's my insanity, and, and, and that you're one of the people that got the message. So what I Well, no, 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 but I had to put it down and go, like I literally had to put it down and go, yeah. I think I need to join AA, or I think right, I need to go check into I drug get rehab, I get and it. I haven't done any of the Listen, drugs, Marty's, just purely reading it. Marty <laughs> Scorsese's directing the movie, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, he took on this movie, and he's no, he's been around some yeah, people. He's, he's like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen because it's it's nutty. It's so that, that, nutty. I, I get that. And what can we to, speaking of nutty, just yeah. to make it a little bit more fun, is um, can you tell the boat story? The boat story. I just told this. You know, I hadn't told it. I told it last night. You know, I meet new friends. They always want to hear the boat story. I'll give you the the, the brief boat story. Okay. And, and the reason why I say this is, we did have a text come in, and it actually said that it said it was said. 
in this in the book is the boat story 100% real or has it been embellished for the book? No, not at all. The, bo the boat story is public record. You can go Google it on. If you go back uh, to um, I think it's July 30th of 27th, no, no June 27th, 1997. It's the boat story is published. Oh, it's a very accurate story. The only thing that it, it's anything it's under embellished. Yeah. Simply because what happened was in a lot of sections in the book were edited down and edited down. Everything in the book is 100 percent true. All right. Let's do, let's do the boat story. But before okay, we go there, I, I just wanted to make the point that I was making before yeah. about it was that the way I see it was that a lot of the personal development, a lot of those things. They really can be used. You can, you can. Uh, you're a very good communicator. I, mean, I would imagine that you use a lot of the NLP skills, for example, to build rapport. And, and you were doing that stuff way before I don't you even knew what it was. I don't use NLP for anything like that at right. all because I don't. And NLP is do is showing you what you do automatic. I don't need to think in terms of NLP. Yes. I'll use NLP to help somebody else break through a problem they're having or belief that they can't, that's holding them back. But for me, I don't you know, some people go around, they try to use NLP to, to get ahead. I don't believe it's made for that at all. And but the fact that, why I went to see Bandler, just so you know, so he took my book, what he did is it's about modeling. Yes. And he said to me, this, he broke down my success. He goes, and he was the one that said, listen, it's the, I'm not going to pay credit. He said to me, because you were doing these things, these four things that you did, and he distilled down my success to its elements. Yes. And that's what I sh it allows me to share it with people, whether it's in two hours or in two days or in two months. I can give people the full, undiluted good and also tell them what not to do. Think, and that's what I was going to yeah. because there's a lot of people out there that, that can set, like, you know, there's a lot of personal development people, there's a lot of people out there pushing success, there's a lot of people that haven't had the heights that you've had, right. but there's also a lot of people that, um, I don't know anybody that's had the low that you, the, the lows that you went through. That's still and alive. Then, yeah. And, and, and that's the, that's the part that interests me. Yeah. But the, I suppose the point that I wanted to make was that I saw, I see, you know, things like persuasion and NLP, a bit like a knife in that you can use it to make a beautiful meal for your family, to help someone someone to, you know, or you can use it to go hold up a liquor store. Yeah. And, and that's the point that I want to get across is, is for me it's really important of having seen what's said on stage and what's written in books and what really goes on in people's lives are two completely different things, mm -hmm. yet you've got the most unique ability of anybody I know because your shit's out there. Right. It's like the, the stuff that a lot of people hide because it's going to affect the book sales or it's going right. to affect no, the... I put it out, the, yeah. Yeah, look, you're already out there. It's like yeah. you're... And then uh, really you're almost like struggling to say, hang on, I've got a lot to... Like, yes, I did all these crazy things and we're going to hear yeah. about it like the sinking of the boat, yeah. but I actually... Behind it is incredible success. And that's, that's the point that I'll is... Tell you, I'll tell you, one of the things was I have you know, different seminars. I give so In the shortest seminars, they're always clamoring. Tell, I said, I'd love to tell you stories. I just don't have time because I'm, I'm here because I want to help people yep. get ahead and make changes, and the stories take up time. But I will tell you, the yacht story, there are some lessons yes. to be learned. <laughs> seed them in. Okay? <laughs> and I'll try to seed in some lessons here, okay? And I would say the first lesson was I had a really lousy making decision strategy, okay? For this whole yacht experience. It's a series of very bad decisions that all rolled up into, you know, an 11-day stint of madness. And it started off with the fact that I had a private jet at the time, and I was sharing it with somebody else, so it was in Europe. So I took a commercial plane, myself, my wife, and uh, three other couples. So it was, it was eight of us in all. We landed in Italy, and when we got off the baggage section, my limo driver forgot to put my wife's luggage on the plane, and she had no clothes. She was freaking out. She watched, I got it, I got it. I said, no problem. And I was already stoned out of my mind. Now, you have to understand that. Now, you're stoned out of your mind you on what? On loose? Lewds, cocaine, and like five other things. The drug addiction I have was so severe. I know. You know listen, so I said, in reading the book, I felt like I needed to go to drug right, house. For those for who him. don't know, for the benefit of your viewers who are normal, <laughs> and haven't been addicted to lewds, thank God for them, right? You know, one lewd is enough to knock out a 220-pound Navy SEAL for eight and a half hours. Wow. I was taking four a day and walking, and walking around. <laughs> <laughs> four at a time, walking around. That was because you get immune to them, right? So I was probably four or five ludes deep and already in the airport. And I was like, don't worry, honey. And you're always slurring, right? <laughs> I'll buy you a bit. The American Express commercial, I'll buy you all new clothes, which we did. Spent 80000 got her a whole new wardrobe. And from there, we made our way to the yacht. And as we're going down the hill in this limousine, there's eight of us in the limo. One of the girls, I think Ophelia, her name was, she's like, why is there like waves in the harbor? And we looked out. And sure enough, there were like these little wavelets in the harbor. When we pulled up to the dock, the captain was out front. And the captain was as crazy as me, by the way. He was, you know, also an action junkie extraordinaire. And my wife runs, runs out of the car with her, all the clothes. What's going on, Captain Mark? What's going on? He's like, well, you know, there's a, there's a storm, a freak storm kicked up. We, we really shouldn't make the crossing. It'll be, 
And she's and I'm like now I'm like wait a second no 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 I'm in this drug induced state I have like ants in my pants like a drug induced ant I, like, I have to move like there's different phases of a quail I'll tell you what they are and your viewers should know this. <laughs> <laughs> is is this the false secret? This is a, this is a, this is a real false secret. This is a real false secret to go nowhere in life, right? The four, first the first phase is the tingle phase where the fingertips tingle and all of you who are, who are, who are out there in television who are dude you know this right? The second thing okay is the slur phase. Where you start to slur your words, but you don't know that. You think you sound great, right? The third phase is the drool phase, where you're drooling out of the side of your mouth, but your loving life is just as much. And the fourth phase is unconsciousness, where you pass out and you wake up somewhere you have no idea where you are. Yeah. Like, like a hangover, right? You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's like, okay, those are the four <laughs> phases, right? Then there's a fifth phase, which doesn't really hit you up, and it's called the movement phase, yeah. where you get like you have to move. Now, I was in the movement phase when we got to the boat, and when the captain said we shouldn't go, I was like, absolutely, we have to make the crossing right now. It's 100 miles to Sardinia. I said to the captain, can we make it? He's like, well, we can make it. It's going to be rough. I said, can we make it? He goes, we can make it. I said, let's go. He's like, all right, let's go. My wife's like, you know, Prances, I'm like, go cut the new tags off your clothes. Come on, go downstairs, right? So we go get on the boat. I go up to the top deck on the flybridge and I say to the students, you know, give me one Bloody Mary every seven minutes till I pass out. Give me one every six minutes after that, right? <laughs> so now an hour and a half later, I take four more ludes. I'm on the top deck, drooling in, in now on the top deck, and all of a sudden, like two hours pass by, and I'm not really track of time, and I wake up to the feeling of sea spray on my face. Now, I'm 50 feet above the water. Oh, wow. I'm like, I'm like, what the hell's going on? And all of a sudden, a giant wave, boom, crashes over me. I fall over, and I get back up. I crawl to the side, grab the crow, and I look over, I'm like, oh, my God, it's like 30-foot waves in the ocean. Like, I've never seen such big waves. I look in back of the boat, and I'm, I'm towing a 40-foot dive boat called the Chandler. My daughter's name is Chandler. I had a little boat with the Chandler, right? And it's disappearing and reappearing in these enormous peaks and troughs of, of, of the Mediterranean Sea. I crawl down the stairs. I make my way to the main salon, and it's complete and utter bedlam. There's decorative plates like flying like frisbee. Statues are falling over. And they're in the middle of my seven other guests, six and my wife. And they're huddled in a circle crying. And I crawl over, and I had no idea what was going on. And she goes, what's where you killed us? We're going to sing it. She's freaking out. Everyone's just going crazy. We go up to the bridge. We see the captain. I'm like, Captain Mark, what's going on? He goes, well, fuck now. He goes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you did it this time, buddy. You know? Because it's a freak storm, there's going to be 30 foot waves plus, and it's only getting worse. All right? So I turned to my friend Rob, who was crazy as me. I said, Rob, you have any coke on you? He goes, yeah, I got right here. Come on, <laughs> I can't. Because this is part of managing your state prior to learning how to do it naturally, right? This is state right? management, <laughs> state management like said, through chemicals. It's like the good, the bad, and the extraordinary in my life, right? So, so anyway, so anyway. This I do tell in my, my longer seminars. I need, I need to kill a little time and change people's state. People, if I see people yawning, I'm like, all right, story time. Story time. time. You know, right? Oh, so you don't just hand out lewds yeah, and coke. Right. Give the stories. The story the stories story changes the state. Yeah. Right. So anyway, so um, oh, you know some NLP, right? Here you go. You get them back to the moment, right? So anyway, so uh, now we're like an hour up on the bridge just watching, and you can't imagine how rough it is. I mean, you're like, it's like the boat is like a thimble. That's the waves are so powerful. And all of a sudden, the cab's like, shit, rogue wave. We're like, what's a rogue wave? Well, the rogue wave, it's like a 50 foot wall of water comes at us. We start climbing up the face in this wave, up and up like the perfect storm, and bam, lights out. We flip over, okay? It takes us about 30 seconds. The boat rights itself, okay? We all like, we try to get up, and we're like, what happened? What happened? There's one engine running now, and all of a sudden the mate comes up, because we just lost the front porthole. It gave way. We're going down by the head. And the boat starts sinking. And this is 100 and 170. It was Coco Chanel's boat. In fact, I had a helicopter on the boat. I had a seaplane. We have, on the boat. I think we have a picture of the, yeah, um, a, the boat. Yeah, you have a boat that's up here or no? Um, it should be coming up. So I could have had slides up here. See, a, yeah. a slide of a baby, oh, a clock, and a clock, and a family. Unfortunately, the only one, the only phone we could find was really bad. Oh, now, notice, a very small image. But so there's a, that's a helicopter. That's the, a helicopter. That's right a helicopter. There. A seaplane? Yeah. Hang on, a helicopter and a seaplane. Seaplane and backman. And isn't it funny how hell so, so, this whole thing with slides you do? So anyway, so it's a very right, right. That's the boat. Not a really good picture of the no. boat. But these are some only one we This is like find. jet skis and whatever. Yep. Okay. So anyway, so uh, we the, we're going down. The captain's like Mayday, Mayday, right? They send out a helicopter from the, the Italian Coast Guard, right? And you know, I think I love Italian people, but like, you know, I don't know if you want to be rescued by them. I think you know, <laughs> maybe the Germans would make better rescuers, you figure, right? They're very precise and stuff, yeah. right? Right? You know, I'm married to an Italian girl, a couple, two, two Italian, well, whatever. Okay. <laughs> You're not really uh, helping the cause no, there. No, 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 anyway, no. okay. So anyway, trying to in increase relations with the other countries, okay? So anyway, so. Uh, they bring out the cop chop and they try to lower down a basket. It's going 100 feet this way, 100 feet that No, not happening, all right? Finally, the three hours, they pull away. We're stuck again. Now, meanwhile, in front of us are 
giant oil tankers. They're boxing us in because we're sinking. So the law of the sea is when you are sinking, everyone tries to help. So we have a <coughs> tanker in front, tankers on the side, right? Finally, six hours later, we get a call. They're sending out the Italian Navy SEALs. Now, this is serious. We all have to go up to the top of the deck, right? And they're going to wait, you know, they're going to come rescue us. We see this giant double-bladed Chinook helicopter coming at us, painted military green. The captain goes, I just got word. We have to push the helicopter off the top of the deck to make room because they're going to land the commando. I'm like, you're shitting me. He's like, no. I'm like, all right, let's do it. So we actually took a video. We're like, hey, we're pushing the helicopter off the top of the deck, right? So we ate one. I love your priorities because you got, you got the, let's put it, like, oh, let's take a video of it. Priorities. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> priorities is, you're not, you're, I'm going to give you a lesson in priorities and in, in the wrong priorities in a second, right? One, two, three, push the helicopter over the side of the boat, okay? Yeah. And we're watching it go down. It's like, I'm really amazing. Then the captain turns to us. We're all 18 of us. It was, eight, 11, it was 11 crew. It was wow. 19 all together, right? He's like, here's the thing. We can only take what we can carry. So we had, I had like a quarter million in cash on the boat. I had artwork. I had jewelry. I turned to my friend Rob. I said, you got the drugs, right? He's like, no, I thought you had the drugs. I'm like, no. I said, Rob, you got to go downstairs. He goes, I'll, go, I'll get them. He goes downstairs. He comes back a minute later. He goes, I can't, your cabin's flooded. It's, I got shocked. The water's electrified. I'm like, soldier, you can do it. He's like, you're right. What was I thinking? He takes <laughs> off his shoes. He goes down. He comes back with a bag of 100 quails and third degree burns on his feet. Okay. We go up to the top deck. Okay. They lower a commando down. He has a spear gun and he, he actually spears the top deck, repels down. Okay. Now the order of exit off the boat is women guests first, women crew members second, male guests third, male crew members fourth, captain last. Logical, right? First person off the boat, my wife, the owner's wife, she was a mother of two, right? Second person off the boat was another woman who had a baby. Third person off the boat is supposed to be a woman, but one of my friends who's on the boat, he panics and he pushes the woman over the side and he jumps. You see people's, it's amazing to see yeah. it. He jumps and I look at my friend Rob, I'm like, this is, we have to kill him the rest of his life. We can abuse him about this moment. This is the <laughs> best thing ever, okay? I wrote about in the book, the guy hates me. So anyway, uh, <laughs> you see things on the internet, you know, Jordan is a douchebag, you know it's from that guy. <laughs> you know it's from that guy. <laughs> okay, so I guess the internet's powerful, you know. So anyway, so they rescue us, the captain goes down with the ship, they pluck him out of the water, they end up landing us on an aircraft carrier, and we get the, they're very nice, and the Italians are the best people to rescue, because when they rescue, they want to feed you. So next thing I know, we're, sick, we're eating prosciutto and melon, drinking red wine, I take two more lewds, and I'm dancing with the Italian Navy, I pass out again, I wake up now, I'm in Sardinia. They take us to Sardinia, it's a beautiful hotel, and they made a big deal over it. They, you know, very nice. And we spent 10 days in Sardinia, I had to buy everybody clothes again. Wife's now on round two. She had no clothes again, I had to buy everybody clothes. We spent 10 days in Sardinia. On the last night, now mind you, you have a private jet, right, which was in France, it was in Charles de Gaulle Airport, and it was flying, that morning it was gonna go from, it was cheaper to keep it in Charles de Gaulle, it's gonna pick us up in Sardinia, right? So the night before, I'm like, you know, do we really want to ship all this? Do we really want to take all this stuff back? Customs is going to be a nightmare. Let's just ship it all back DHL. Reasonable idea. So we all boxed up all our clothes, no clothes now. We just have toothpaste and underwear, right? Ship it all out. We go to the airport. Now, the thing about a private jet, you've been on private jets, you said. They're there waiting for you. The whole beauty of a private jet is when you get there, it's there. We get to the airport, no private jet. I'm like, what the hell? So we're waiting for like a half hour. And the worst part of all is the drugs were gone. So there was no reason to be in a foreign country <laughs> anymore, right? So I'm waiting for this, an hour and a half, no jet. Finally, some little midget comes scampering up to me. A midget was in the airport, right? And he's like, he was an Italian Sardinian midget and he came up work, work, working for me. It's true, you know? Okay. And, uh, and he's like, Mr. Belfort. I'm like, yeah, he goes, plane crash. I'm like, what? My yacht and my plane gone in 10 days. Can you imagine the plane crash taking off out of Orly Airport? Wow. A seagull, Charles Gaulle, a seagull flew in the engine, plane went down, the pilots lived. So now I have a, a lost a plane and a boat. You think I would have taken this as a sign that yeah. I should calm down and change my course, right? Yeah. But I didn't because I was addicted to drugs. In fact, I ended up trying to commit suicide a year later after overdosing on you know, massive quantities of cocaine. And this, and this is what interests me, and I was saying this yeah. to you before the show, is that my father committed suicide. Mm -hmm. you know, and, that, and that my real interest is what makes people shift? What makes, how do you go one way? I remember reading in a book of Dennis Rodman, the basketball player for Chicago Bulls, that he was sitting in a, the cab of his truck and he had the, you know, the gun in his mouth ready to actually kill himself. And a voice said, don't kill this Dennis, kill the other dentist, meaning kill the dentist that is mm -hmm. the one that you don't want to be, the yeah. one that is causing the stress, and mm -hmm. be the real you. Be, just be real you. Mm -hmm. And 
I, that changed my life, reading that. What was it that has um, helped you go from, you know, money laundering, the drugs, the prostitution, all of that stuff, to then being put in jail yeah. and, and then serving time, mm -hmm. coming out, and being able to just, because we all tell limiting stories. We all tell, we all have these limiting beliefs of, oh, I did this, and, you know, like I, we hold ourselves back. Yeah, of you, ha you have a lot that could yeah. have held you back, yeah. and yet yeah. you managed to reconcile. My understanding is um, you have, is it reparate, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, was it, um, you know, where you... you yeah, yeah, I paid a lot of it back, and I still pay, pay money back, but I'll, I'll tell you what it was for me, just so you know, and everybody's different, okay? When I came out of jail, I had so many limiting beliefs about what I could do with my life, you know, after making the mistakes that I made. And here's the thing about your past. And once you can, gr if there's one thing that your viewers, if there's one thing that you can actually get from all this, one distinction, it's that no matter what happened to you in your past, you are not your past. Mm. You are the resources and capabilities you glean from it. You are not your past. You are the resources and capabilities you glean from it. And that is the basis for all change. Because the worse your life is, if you've survived the worst of the worst, if you've made the biggest mistakes and are still breathing, yeah. then you can learn from that. And that builds muscle. Mm. How do you build? When you go to the gym to build muscles in your arms, what do you do? You don't push against lightweight. You've got to push against extraordinary weight to get to failure. Yeah. And that's why you learn more from failure. You go stronger from failure than from success. Ask any successful person and they will tell you they fail five or ten times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, mo the, the, the more crap in your life that you've survived, mm. if you're willing to just reverse the angle, to look at things from a slightly different angle, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Mm. And you will find so much power, so much passion, and so much internal fortitude from your past if you have a destination, meaning a vision, mm -hmm. something you truly believe in, that you desire, not a goal. You know, everyone, goals are like buzzwords for failure. Every asshole has a goal and they're mostly full of crap. Yep. Now you need goals, but it's not enough because goals get abandoned, but the vision remains. If you have a vision and you want to look at your beliefs as resources and you need that as strategy, and here's the key. A strategy for success. In that book, I came up with the most effective persuasion strategy in the history of Wall Street. It's still used by many of the big firms today. All the cold calls use all the scripts and, and the straight line system. It's what, I, it's what I teach in seminars, but I teach people how to use this as a force for good. That's one of the first, when I give a seminar, the first thing I say is this. Some of the things I'm saying right now is not, rule number one. There's some stuff I'm going to say, it's very manipulative. It'll allow you to take people's money for bad reasons to get people to buy things they shouldn't buy. And if you do that, you might make some money in the short term, but you'll end up broke, morally bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt, and hopefully in jail. However, if you use the skills, the persuasion is a force for good, to help people break through barriers, to yes. overcome fears and limitations Agreed. and obstacles, to so take, take action. Instead of thinking about taking action, then you will make more money than you dream possible, live a life of such passion and glory at the highest level. Yeah. That's what this is about. I mean, I, show people, and, I, it's, and it's really, it's an A, B, C, one through three, paint by number, step by step, move by move system, that any monkey, it's like literally, any kid could do, a baby could do it. That's how simple yeah. it is. And when you do that, everyone's like, oh my God, I, I never realized how simple that is. And that gives them the extra belief to go forward. So my goal is this, when I meet someone, it's, I hit them, you can't hit them from three ways, it's four. If one of them is missing, it doesn't work. You can have all the vision you want. You can have empowering beliefs. You can manage your state to a razor's edge. If you've got a bad strategy, you're still going to fail. Agreed. Okay? But if you have all four things and you're even mildly good at them, you can't help but succeed. Yep. Now, it's not, you know, I'm a big believer. There's only one way to get rich quick. There's only one way to get rich quick. One way, quick. However, what takes a long time is to get everything lined up to get to the point Yep. when you get rich quick. Yep. So it's not like a get rich quick scheme, you gotta rich overnight, but when it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of pieces of the puzzle, when those pieces are in place, the money just rolls in and freedom rolls out. Yep. And that's what true success is about. You ever see Jerry Maguire, I'm sure you have, right? Yeah, I love the film. Remember the Quan? Yes. That's what I give to people. I show people how to obtain their Quan. Mm. And it's real simple. Simple as that. Mm.
So where are you at now? Are you, you're obviously a writer. Um, I'm, yeah, you, I'm a writer and I do, a, I give, I do uh, seminars to people and I speak all over the world. I'm yep. just actually on a world tour and I'm leaving to the UK next week. And wow. uh, it's the name of my seminar is Extreme Wealth and Success While Maintaining Your Integrity and Ethics. Lovely. And that's my message is make, listen, like you said, you want the Freud? You want, have three. Yeah. But if you made enough to get three Ferraris, then you should give 30 times that in value. Yes. It's about giving value and helping people. If you do that, the money comes naturally. So I'm doing the UK. Then from there, I'm going to uh, actually to Asia. I'm speaking with Tony Blair. It's got a, on the same stage as Tony Blair in Asia. I'm doing two, one in Malaysia. Wow. Pretty from a guy that was once in jail, right? Now yeah. I know on stage with a former Prime Minister of Britain. Then I'm going to um, do four cities in Australia, then Canada. U.S. and that's what I do, and I and this is my. I was going to say when you're in Australia, I'll take you sailing, and yeah. then I just went. Uh, actually, no, I won't. Listen, <laughs> and I'll tell you. And by the way, I like you, I like the boat. This is very, <laughs> very interesting. Right? I'll tell you something interesting about Australia, and uh, and you can Google this. This is a true story. Is that these four things that I teach, they apply to anything, mm. even sports, especially sports, sports, because it's so measurable. Mm. I worked with a rugby team there called the Melbourne Storm, yep. which I'm sure you know. Yep. Great team, and they were just getting into the into the into the playoffs, right? And the year prior, they'd done pretty well. They'd gotten annihilated by Manly, forty-three to three. That's where I live, Manly. Man Manly, right? So I was called in to give a speech to them, a, a, a motivational speech, where I used my four things with the Melbourne Storm athletes, and they're um, phenomenal guys. And I focused on everything but strategy because they have the strategy. So I, I, yeah, you had to know your audience. I'm not going to tell them how to play rugby, but <laughs> I showed them how to create a vision of winning. Hmm. Not we're going to win, let's set a goal, but way beyond. I had them so inserted into the winning vision that they could see the spiral spinning. Hmm. I literally had them totally like drooling in the, in the room. Hmm. I showed them how to anchor in states of confidence and certainty to turn their bodies into steel in the room. The beliefs that whatever happened last year was irrelevant, that they had the best coaching, the best preparation, right? Best physicality. That weekend they went and they beat Manly 46 to 0. Mm -hmm. Although 46 6 out, because it was 46 0, then they took their four players out and Manly scored six points at the end. They destroyed Manly. They called me back again the next week, right? Before they played, um, I forgot who it was. They played some other yeah. team. Par no, no, that was, the, that was in the finals, right? They destroyed the next team 40 0. Wow. The final or, or, or thereabouts, right? And then, it was on, and then it was, they were filming me. I was giving a motivational speech on the field, and it was all over the news in Australia that I was doing this, and they went on and they won the premiership. Wow. And I got a lot of credit for that, and I, you know, I probably didn't deserve it, but maybe I did, you know, who really knows? Well, the no, point, it's the, the things I did with, you know, with athletes like Billy Slater and Craig Inglis, these are, you know, uh, uh, amazing athletes, but for them, it's, you know, the difference between amazing and extraordinary, that next level up, it's this much, hmm. it's, it's a millimeter, that's all it is. And it's like, you know what happens is in life, it's this, and this is, this is a great example. What happens to the guy who wins the gold medal in the Olympics in the 100 meter dash, right? He gets his face on Wheaties boxes, he gets the big checks, he gets the sponsorship deals. Yet, how much faster was he than the guy who came in second? Like yeah, one, well. one thousandth of a second, right? And that guy, well, he gets a couple of applause, maybe he gets a sponsorship deal, but the guy who came in fourth, what does he get? A, a lump of coal. Yeah. And he's probably separated by a thousandth of a second too. Yeah. Okay, life is a game of inches, it's a game of millimeters. And these distinctions that I teach, they're so powerful. And that's what, when, I, I, when I'm on stage, I get really passionate, you know, and, and sometimes I will cry, sometimes the audience will because I talk about my life and my mistakes, and I'll tell you what my mistakes were. Let me get, it's important to talk about that too, what yeah. the mistakes were. Really quick, the number one mistake that I made is I had the most destructive belief inserted in me, and beliefs are inserted in us from the time we're this big. Yeah. When I first made my money, the first thing I did, I made $650,000 in one stock trade. You know what I did? I didn't buy a house. I bought a white Ferrari Testarossa. Why? Because Don Johnson drove one of Miami Vice. Thought I had to have it. He was cool. Second thing I did, I took a plane out to the West Coast and checked into the presidential suite of the Regent Beverly Wilshire. Why? Because Richard uh, Gere had done it in Pretty Woman. But the most destructive belief that I followed was Gordon Gecko, who said greed was good. And it's bullshit. Greed is not good. It's ambition that's good. And it's passion that's good. When you have greed in your life, the first thing that goes out the window is ethics. It's, it's like this. Yeah. You don't lose your soul on Wall Street or any other street all at once. It's a bit at a time. It's tiny, yeah. imperceptible steps. You know, you do something, you're doing everything right. You step over the line, you step back. You're like, oh, I got you know, nothing bad happened. But next time you step over the line, the lines move. So you step a little bit further, further still, further still. And all of a sudden, a couple of years pass, you're doing things you never thought you'd do. 
You're associating with people you never thought you'd associate with, and you, everything seems just all right. It's mm -hmm. like dipping your toe into a piping hot bathtub. You, oh my God, it's so hot, right? Five minutes later, you're underwater, and the water feels perfect. Yeah. That's how we're built. We habituate yeah. on our emotions. And that's what I wanted to say was that I, I'm, I'm very grateful to people like yourself and the, the gentleman that was in my life where you know, he, he's now serving time in jail for fraud was that you, know, you can't have hot without cold. You can't What's have his good. name? Was there, is that like a secret or something? Well, I don't. I, it's curiosity. Yeah? I just I don't feel comfortable saying okay, his name it. in that. You'll tell me off screen. Yeah, I'll yeah. tell you off screen. Okay. Absolutely. Um, well, no, it's just. <laughs> then I'll post it on the internet on your site so everyone, your audience won't get mad. Yeah, I, I just, I, it, you know, if, unless I've spoken to him and that he would be okay with that, I don't know where he's at in his life. And, and, but I just know that, yeah. I, but what I was going to say was that. Um, you can't have hot without cold, good without bad, up without down. It's a you, world you, you of duality. Yeah, it's, we live in a, in a, in a very um, dualistic world where you have all of those things. And it's wonderful to have, you know, somebody has to do what you did. Mm -hmm. And you did it. And thank you for A, doing it, and then not just shutting up and going away. But mm -hmm. thank you for doing it and then actually saying, like, I, I made a mistake. I, I screwed this up. And, it, and it, what it does is it actually allows other people... To, who are in forms of success where they can feel that line creep because that's what you do is when you start reading the book you're like oh wow you know it's like he's successful successful you're and all like, of a like stop what are you doing like what are you why are you, what, yeah, was, why yeah, are you what, doing what's, it? Wrong, what's wrong why are you doing that like, you're, you're making it you're making you could do make eight hundred thousand a week legitimately why are you going why, to get you doing yeah, that yeah. and but but what it is though is, is it actually serves as a wonderful lesson and i think that you've got a lot to offer the world in the form of success but I would say that there's a lot of people like Tony Robbins and, 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 and the, the people of that ilk out there that can, you know, they, they do a very good job of, perform, of delivering that. Mm -hmm. What no one really does, though, is sort of says, hey, I, I screwed this up big time, and you're going to still have success. If you do these four things, you're going to have success, but make sure you do it ethically. Make sure you do yeah. it. And to really come from that personal experience. And I, I really, I appreciate that. I thank you for that, because it would have been easy to have just... Eh, like, right. you know, hidden or let your, your story be those excuses. Um, and I think it's a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful gift that you can actually turn around and give to people. You know what it is? Let me tell you, when, when you have something inside you that you're really passionate about, I'm, it's like sometimes I'm like, I'm, I'm dying to tell people, like, listen, it's easy. Hmm. Number two, it works. Number three, you can do it. Hmm. Anyone could do it, a baby could do it. Mm. And people get caught up in the daily cycle of life, right? And they just go about it and they get cubby holed into a state of learned helplessness. And yeah. you know what, in this economy, in this decade that's upon us now, if you have that mentality, a poverty mentality, you're gonna end up in, in trouble. You're not gonna be able to retire with dignity. You're not gonna be able to take care of your family, protect your family. The, the stakes are, are real here. It's not about like, you know, well, let's be successful, we'll be out. You, Average is death right now. Yeah. It just is. The government's not going to be there to take care of you. You know how much to, I have two kids and they go to private school because I make a lot of money because I work hard. Mm. And you know what? Our your kids, my, if you have kids or whatever, your kids deserve to go to the best schools. If something God forbid happens health wise, you deserve to have the best health care. That's what having money is all about. And you know what money is like? It's like oxygen. Mm. You need it to breathe, but there's only so much you can use in any one lifetime. Yeah. After that, you give it away. Well, it just gets, it gets given away automatically. You die, will, it goes on no, to other you people. Give it away, Wallace, and trust <laughs> yeah. me, the money I make, I'll give half to charity. Yeah. Okay, because I don't need that much. I live a great life. I don't need that much. Okay. Yeah. But the bottom line is this for anyone who's watching, for your free viewers, okay, this is not a decade that you could just sit on your hands and let things be business as usual. Mm. You need to take action. I'm not trying to make it into like a buzzword. You need to do something because it's not the status quo. It's a, it's, a, it's a decade of empowerment. People that take, make the right moves right now are gonna do really, really well. Yeah. The people that subscribe to the old thinking of the past, which is bankrupt thinking, which is you know working for a company and just thinking that the government or the company's gonna take care of you, uh-uh, it ain't, ain't gonna be anymore. It's just mm. not the way it's gonna be. You wanna work for a company? Ah, great. Not mm. everyone's meant to own their own business. You don't, listen, I respect the woman I'm in love with, she's a, she's a, she was a, a, a stay-at-home mom. The most noble job in the world. There's no noble, more noble job than that. But somehow, there's got to be someone in the family unit that's responsible for bringing in money because simply it's a problem that needs to be solved. The money problem that needs to be solved. And my think is this. It's so easy to make money, so you might as well do, it, what you'll, do what you love, be passionate and make your money like that. Don't make your money by working something that you hate and every day is a chore. That's not a mm. life. And, that, and that's the thing is you, you made your money 
in, uh, in your brokerage firm, really, from educating, breaking people's beliefs, pulling together a good culture. There's like this, those success principles that you had then, and and I th so what I say is what you love. Four, there's four. There's, I, I, I left well, we're gonna have we're gonna have to wrap. Real so let's, we'll do the four. Four things. Ready? Yep. Okay. Then the last thing I'm gonna leave you with. Four things. Number one is the is the ability to create a vision. The second thing is your state management. Third is your beliefs. The fourth is your strategies. And the last thing, which is not, a, it's just the glue that holds everything together. That's your standards yeah. of where you want to live, like what you will not settle for less than. Yeah. And that's in the end what, you know, some people's standards, these, they, they have to pay all their bills, so they pay all their bills. Yeah. Others have to pay some of the bills, so they pay some of their bills. Others have to pay everyone's bills, and they do that. Yeah. Okay, your standards are your musts in life. And you need, the first thing I say to people, my brokers, I did this, I raised their standards. standards. They would not settle for average. Yeah. Let me tell you, there's a different, what you have to do to be comfortable in this world and what you got to be to be rich in this world, two entirely different things, mm. different mentalities. I'm going to leave on, on this because it is it, on the old you and the new and the new you, if you like prior to coming out of, you know, um, so the old you prior to jail, coming out of jail, what were your values, top three values? Before? Before. Money, yep. power, sex. Okay. And now what are your top three values? Giving. Yep. Family, yep. freedom. Wow. And that's a big shift. Thank you very much.